is up guys so this is gonna be a tutorial of the basics ukulele 101 because i get a lot of the same questions that are that are all kind of uh, beginner-esque questions all right and um just kind of wanted to clear up some myths and, and misunderstandings that some people have so um I'm just going to kind of go through a lot of just the basic stuff. If you if you're an intermediate or, you know, advanced player, then there's nothing you're probably really going to learn from this video, but uh but I felt like this is a video that I kind of needed to put out there. So, uh the tuning on a soprano, tenor, or a concert size ukulele is 99% of the time going to be G C E A, which sounds like this. Okay, G, C, E, A. And then, um, as I said, those three sizes, this is a tenor size ukulele. When you're trying to determine the size of the ukulele, it's mostly based off of your personal body size. Um, you can play any size ukulele. I could play a soprano, which is the smallest one, a concert's right in the middle, and then the tenor is the biggest. I have here my first ukulele ever. This is a soprano. This is a tenor. And then I have a concert. Uh, uh, concert size. Next to a tenor. So it's not that much smaller. But it is, it is a little bit smaller. Uh, the fretboard is a little bit narrower. Um, the frets are a little bit closer together. Stuff like that. Signed by James Hill right there. Shout out. Anyway, so um, uh, so that when it, people people ask, can I play this on a soprano? Can I play this on a concert? It's the same instrument. It's the same thing. It's just a little bit bigger or smaller. When you're fitting to try and fit the size of your ukulele with your body, the idea is that your elbow is going to interlock right here at the bottom, and your hand should be able to grab it about like this. Okay, so it's kind of like you're holding it almost like a gun, right? And this is like the comfortable fit because when you're strumming, you don't want to strum um, like a guitar. I'm pretty sure you're supposed to strum kind of over the sound hole because of the size. A ukulele, you want to strum closer up to where the neck meets the body. So you want to kind of strum it up here. So that's your ideal, your ideal size. If you see like on a soprano, if I do that, my hand's way up here, right? This is really out of tune. Don't pay attention to this tuning, but my hand's way up here. So size-wise, like you can still play and you can still manage, but it is not going to be the most comfortable fit, if you will. Um, and when we're talking about costs of ukulele, whether it's these, these are the Riptide ukuleles that I carry on my website, um, or it's, it's any ukulele, there's a, a few variables that you want to pay attention to. Size, obviously, since it's made out of wood, the more wood, the more it's going to cost. The bigger the uke, the more wood it's going to take to make it. So, a tenor size ukulele is going to be the most expensive of those three models. A model we haven't talked about is a baritone, which is tuned uh, completely different than the other three previous models. Um, so it's kind of, in a sense, it's more like a, a deeper tone. Um, so I, I don't play baritone. I've never played a baritone, and I don't really know its different chords and everything. So it's it's almost, in a sense, a different instrument just because it's tuned completely different, um, aside from the sense that it's a small acoustic instrument. Um, but anyway, back to the, the cost. The, the, the variables, there's a few of them. The variables are the size, obviously, that I said, uh, the types of wood, and quality, like any other product that's out there. Um, a, a big one on on acoustic instruments is the type of wood. Um, so this is a rosewood ukulele, and rosewood has nice acoustics. It's not a very rare or expensive wood uh, per se. And this runs uh, on the website is is two ninety nine. So you get an idea of price. Now, this was forty dollars. And you can kind of tell, like, and you feel it if you guys could could just grab a hold of this. You can see it's it's not the highest of quality. Uh, it's just kind of laminated, you know, whatever, like, little cheap plywood kind of stuff. Um, 
which is fine for beginners if you're just trying to pick it up and just kind of trying to get a feel for it. But once you really start playing, you can totally tell the difference of quality between the woods. Um, this, I believe, is mahogany. I don't think it says in here, but I, I'm pretty sure this is mahogany. This was about a hundred bucks. Um, I believe it's like a hundred and twenty or so. Um, and I carry Riptide, which is this Riptide, but this size, which it's about the same price, about one hundred twenty dollars. Um, and mahogany is one of the most common woods used. It's it's very easy to find, so it's not that expensive, and the acoustics are good on it. Now, there also is. Oh, <sighs> So many ukuleles here. I didn't even realize I really had this many. But um, this is my uh, this is my most expensive uke that I have, and this is made out of actually koa wood. Uh, and koa, as far as acoustics go, is supposed to be the best, um, or one of the best. It depends on who you talk to. But a lot of people consider koa the best wood, especially Hawaiian koa. This is actually Japanese koa, and this is tuned with a low G. So it's got a little bit of a different sound. It sounds a lot more like a guitar. Um, but yeah, so this is this is koa wood, and so it just resonates a little bit different and has a little bit of a different sound. This is also a tenor size, so that you can kind of get an idea on the size. It fits, you know, perfectly for you guys to uh, put it into perspective. I'm about six foot tall, right? So if you're around that same size, then, uh, then a tenor size is what I would personally suggest for you. Um, and then you kind of go down from there. It's not, it's not really anything to get too hung up on because it, if, if you can play, you can play. It's not that big of a deal and it's not going to really inhibit your learning that much one way or the other. Now on to the actual playing. I'm going to touch on strumming and give you guys the deep, dark secret of strumming, which, uh, I haven't done for a while because I was wanting to, to kind of like perfect it as far as giving it, um, out to you guys on YouTube so that it's a little easier to understand. But before I talk about the deep dark secret of strumming, I'm going to touch on the fing uh, finger placement when you're playing. Now, majority of the chords are played on the first four frets uh, of the ukulele. When we're talking about strings, you want to talk about them as if it's uh, like levels in a building. So the bottom string is your first string, then it goes up to the second, up to the third, and then the top string is the fourth string. That's the correct way to do it. People sometimes go the other way and they'll say third string and be down here. But you're supposed to go up as if it's like floors on a building. Um, so when you're talking about it or people are talking about it, that's how it should be. Uh, that's like the quote unquote right way to do it. Um, and now you can see you have four fingers, four strings, and most of the chords are played on the first four frets, which is what makes the ukulele such an easy instrument to learn. Um, one of the things that I learned is that you want to try, uh, I went to a workshop actually at a, a ukulele festival, and you want to always try for sake of the quickness of switching between chords and notes, you want to always try and use the finger that's closest to that fret, or closest to that, yeah, to that fret. Um, and, and pinkies are really hard to use and they're really hard to get comfortable with. Um, and so that's one thing that I really should encourage you guys to try and practice and get good at because, uh, it basically gives you four fingers instead of three to play with. Uh, for the longest time, I only really played with my, my middle three fingers and I didn't use my pinky at all. Um, but if you guys can play, uh, and, and add your pinky in there for certain notes, um, I know everyone hates the E, and I don't suggest using your pinky to try and do that. But, um, you know, if you can touch on stuff on the fourth fret and, and stuff like that, you really should try and get used to using your pinky because it will, will really help improve your playing. Um, I think that's pretty much it as far as, like, the finger placement. There's not really too much. It's all just comfort. Um, and you want to always play kind of directly straight on at it unless you're barring because if what happens is if if I'm playing this top string here I know this is kind of zoomed out for you guys but if I'm playing this top string right there which would be an A minor if I have my finger dragged down and it's over this third string you see it's muted and I'm not pushing down all the way if I push down right but you want to have it straight on so that it all rings out and that you hear every note so every every um, note you're playing on every chord, you want it to be like a straight on 
attack, if you will, on the actual string. Um, and that will give you the clarity uh, when you're playing. And then bars is the same way. You really want to make sure you're pushed down on all the strings if you're barring like this. Because if you have like one end loose, like I have the bottom string is kind of loose right now. You can kind of hear it. And so you really want to just make sure that you're pressing in. And what gives you the sound and the resonance is the string being pushed all the way against the fret. And then it makes, you know, a straight line from this fret all the way down to the bottom. And then that's what gives you the clear sound. So what, what gives it that muffled sound is if you're not pushed up all the way against the fret. And it, what it does is it vibrates back and forth and against the fret and like your finger. And it mutes it. Um, one more before we get into the strumming. Explaining how the sound works. For the longest time, because most all ukuleles I've seen are like this. Right, and for the longest time, they have the sound hole right in the middle. I thought what happened is the strings were over the sound hole, and then the sound went into the sound hole and then came back out, which isn't really how it works. What happens is it goes down here to the bottom, and this is attached like to the inside, like the inside in here part of the ukulele, which you can't see obviously, and it resonates inside there and then comes out the sound hole. So nothing goes in the sound hole per se. It's it's all going in from the bottom here and then comes out through the sound hole as it resonates within the ukulele, like the body of the ukulele. So that's why on a model like this, and people come up with some creative designs, is that it's the same idea, the sound holes are just in different spots. Um, and some there's some ukes that will have sound holes on the back, back here, and you can kind of like wiggle it and give it like a wah pedal kind of effect. Stuff like that's kind of cool. All right, on to the deep, dark strum secrets. So the biggest question I always get asked on every single video is what is the strum pattern? And I'm telling you, I never ever learn a strum pattern except for maybe like somewhere over the rainbow where it's really clear cut and it's really, really uh, noticeable in the song. Or like Hey Soul Sister by Train. The songs that are played on the ukulele, then you want to try and copy their strum pattern. Most songs, however, at least the stuff that I do, is not played on the ukulele. So... For strums, the secret to strumming, the one secret, drum roll please, is you want to always have your hand moving in a constant motion. So, for example, I'm just going to play a G, right? If, if I'm playing a G, no matter what the song is, if I keep my hand in it, you can think of it as like a, a metronome, how like you'll have like the beat in the background if you like record anything on GarageBand, there's a metronome effect. It's just that beat to kind of keep you on pace. If you don't have your hand constantly strumming, it's very hard to stay on the same pace. So you can think of it as your metronome. Whether you're hitting the strings or not, you can think of it as like your beat or if you're tapping your foot to a song or snapping or whatever. It's the same idea. So you want to constantly keep constant movement, constant speed and rhythm with your strum. And with that, you can do a ton of different strums. And that is usually what I do. I honestly, I just, my hand moves the same motion, but then when I hit the strings, it's just different times. And then that's all just part of you getting comfortable with your own play style. So I'll give you some examples here. My hand is gonna go the same motion the whole time. So it goes. So you kind of see that, right? So, so my hand is moving that same motion the whole time and it's completely different strums. The only thing I'm changing is when I hit the strings, when I mute them and when I let them ring out. So if you're learning what I highly suggest, the question I also always get is singing. It's like, oh, well, like, do you have a hard time singing? I almost quit playing when I started like two weeks in because I would sing and so I'd be like, somewhere over the rainbow and like I would say and strum as I would say like the same exact time and now that's not what you want to do obviously you want to get to the point where, where you can do each other independent but in order to do that your hand has to be at a constant movement that way you can get to the point where you're not focused on it so um what you want to do is just practice that whether you do like a basic 
a basic strum and your hand is just moving the same speed and it's just a down strum and then you can like graduate if you will up to like a Right, so you guys can kind of see that, but my hand is moving the same speed the whole time, and obviously you can speed it up. But even then, my hand is still moving the same speed. I'm, I'm only going one speed with my hand. Um, and that is really the secret and the trick to successful strumming when it comes to the ukulele, as far as I have found. Um, and I would say that my the rhythm of my strumming, for me as a player, is what I'm strong at, and I'm not very good at picking. Um, and the reason that I feel like that rhythmic part has been successful, if you will, for me is, is just because of that constant strum and that constant beat. Um, sorry, my phone's ringing. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but that constant beat. So, um, as far as practicing guys, go ahead and you can go back through this video and check out any of the parts that you had questions on by all means comment. Um, and let me know if you do have questions, if you found this at all helpful, please give it a thumbs up. I'm helping you. You help me give it that thumbs up. Um, and, and seriously, let me know if you guys have questions, comment, rate, subscribe. Um, and I think that's pretty much it, but, but ask questions down here, uh, in the comment section. And I will try and answer. I want this video to be like the the video for beginner basics as far as just playing. Not a song or anything like that. But just the idea of playing the ukulele. And, and this to clarify any you know misunderstandings that anyone does have. So that being said, thank you guys for watching. Have a good one. And I will talk to you guys soon. Later.